Buckingham Palace Connection, a five-part serial dramatised for radio by Ted Willis from his own novel, with Maurice Denham as Lord Tremaine, Jeremy Clyde as Captain Tremaine, Joyce Carey as Lady Tremaine, Elizabeth Proud as Meg, Michael Aldridge as George V, Victor Spinetti as Lloyd George, Miriam Margulies as Maria, and Ted Willis as himself. Part one, an interview with the King. Let me introduce myself and make a small explanation. My name is Ted Willis, and I have written the five-part serial. Now, I know it is not usual for an author to appear in his own work, and I apologize for the intrusion. My excuse is that I was involved in a direct and very personal way in this extraordinary story, and therefore, in a certain sense, my presence is essential if I am to tell it correctly. Let me explain. You see, for my sins, although at the time of my elevation they said it was for my virtues, I am not only a writer, I am also a member of the House of Lords. And it was there, one afternoon during that long hot summer of 1976, that the whole thing began, for me at least. I was a little late getting to the House that day, and question time was almost over by the time I entered the chamber. The Baroness Ward of North Tyneside. My lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Can Her Majesty's government tell the House whether there are any hitherto unpublished documents in the archives of the Foreign Office which relate to the murder of the Tsar and the Russian Imperial family by the Bolsheviks in 1918? And if so whether they will make an up-to-date statement on this matter so that the full facts may be known. My lords, all the available documents in the possession of Her Majesty's government relating to the assassination of Tsar Nicholas II and his family are open to the public at the Public Records Office. It is for historians to assess this and other evidence. It is not a matter on which the government have pronounced or could pronounce. My lords, is the minister aware that a book called File on the Tsar has recently been published which challenges the official account of this tragic event and puts forward some interesting new facts? Would it not be possible for the government to make just a general statement as to these new facts? As I have said, this is not a matter on which the government could pronounce. I have no doubt that the book to which the noble baroness refers is a substantial production, but it is for historians and not governments to assess its value. May I ask the minister whether he is absolutely satisfied that all the imperial family were murdered at Ekaterinburg? I am not referring to the well-known case of the Grand Duchess Anastasia, who, as many people believe, escaped to the West, but to the other three daughters. Is the minister positive that these are not alive? No, my lords, I cannot be positive on this matter, nor do I think that anybody can be absolutely satisfied on that point. <laughs> and that, for the moment, was that. The house moved on to other business. I sat in the chamber for another 30 minutes or so, but my mind wasn't really on the debate. A piece of music kept ringing in my head, the old Russian imperial anthem. And I was thinking about the Tsar and his family, and my mind went back almost 60 years to that bank cellar in Ekaterinburg, where they were all supposed to have died. Had any of them survived? Was it possible? Still busy with these thoughts, I went to the bar and took a cooling drink to a quiet corner. An elderly peer, whom I didn't recognise, was sitting in an armchair across the room, but he seemed to be half asleep, so I thought I would be safe from interruption. But suddenly he opened his eyes and stared at me with that fierce, uncompromising look, which is common to the very old and to the very young. Your name Willis? Yes, uh, yes it is. Uh, you're the writer chap, are you? Do a bit of writing, do you? A bit, yes. Uh, bring your drink over here. I can't keep shouting across the damn room. Right. 
There we are. Uh, Spedder. No, I, I'm Tremaine. Tremaine of Tremeric. Were you in the house at question time? Part of it. Did you hear the question about the Romanov? The Tsar and his family? Yes, fascinating. Uh, the half of it. I'm sorry, I... Uh... They don't know the half of it. I could tell you a story. The Tsar? About what happened? Yes. No, I have to be going. I'm trained to catch. Nice talking to you. Always wanted to have a go to writing myself, but no good. Heaven forgive Florence. It was a curious little conversation, and it left me with that slight tightening of the spine which always comes when I feel that I'm on the threshold of a story. As luck would have it, Lord Whitby came into the bar at that moment. George Whitby always seems to know everything about everybody. Cheers, my friend. What are you drinking? I'm all right for the moment, thanks, George. Uh, scotch on the rock, Sam, please. Yes, well, George, uh, that peer you passed on the way in. Tremaine? That's the one. Uh, what do you know about him? Well, he lives down in Cornwall somewhere. Oh, wait, yes, he has a place at Trevelic near Zeno. First time I've seen him in the house. No, it doesn't come much these days. Your scotch, Lord. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Tremaine, uh, curious chap. My guess is that he came in today to hear what the government would say in answer to Lady Ward's question. Why should he be interested? Well, I have an idea he was around at the time that the Tsar was killed. Served in the Foreign Office, you know. One of those mysterious assignments you don't hear much about. He was in Russia during the Revolution. Uh, Rumour has it that he organised an escape route across Russia. Regular James Bond... They say he got Kerensky out under the very noses of the Bolsheviks. Yes, look him up in the book, old boy. I think you'll find that he served in Leningrad when they still called it Petrograd. It must have been during the First World War. Excuse me, Lord Willis. A message for you. Ah, thank you. It's from Tremaine. A privileged old boy. He doesn't write to everybody. He's asked me to go down and see him. Doubly privileged. Will you go? I'm halfway there already. I set out at the crack of dawn the next morning. Unfortunately, it was holiday time and I got caught up in the swarming traffic which crowds the narrow roads of the west in summer. And there were times when I regretted making the journey. But all the grittiness and irritation dissolved when I reached the coast road with the clean, bright sea on my right and the brown and purple of the Cornish moors to my left. The road led me to Zenor, where I stopped at the Tinner's Arms for a drink and a snack lunch. A ham sandwich and a pint of bitter, please. We're a bit crowded, sir. But there's a seat at yon table by the window. Uh, Percy, make room for this gentleman, will you? Aye, there's your place here. Thank you. There we are. Our seat in the place. Much obliged. Oh, another marvellous day. Aye, cheers that. Stay in here? No, just sort of passing through. Ah. You're local, are you? Born and bred. Fisherman? And I can't be. Can I offer you the other half? I won't say no. Thank you. I'm on the bitter. Ah, if you please, Harry. Come in. You must know this area pretty well. Well, as anyone, I should reckon. I'm looking for a place called Trevelic. Viscount Tremaine lives there. <clears throat> I wouldn't know it, sir. But it can't be far from here. I'm a writer, you oh, yeah, see. I can't help you, sir. No, uh, I, I, I must be getting back. Wait, your drink. You haven't had your drink. Here we are. Now, where's he gone? I don't understand it. He was friendly enough until I asked him to give me some directions. Then he just sort of clammed up. He can be a bit cussed at times, sir. Where did you want to go? But it's like now. Trevelic. Trevelic? I was told it was just a few miles from Zenor. Viscount Tremaine's place. Might I ask what your interests would be, sir? Well, among other things, I'm a writer, and I... A writer? Well, fancy that now. Look, can you direct me? I can't, sir. I reckon you must have it wrong. There's no place called by that name round here. I can vouch for that. But there is. There must Excuse be. Excuse me, Look. sir. By this time, I was beginning to think that I'd got it all wrong. But there it was, the address I'd copied down. Viscount Tremaine of Trevelic, near Zenor, Cornwall. These local people must have heard of it. And if so, why had they been so secretive, even hostile? I finished my beer and sandwich and strolled over to the church. Afternoon, sir. 
Can I help you in any way? I'm looking for a place called Trevelic, where Viscount Tremaine lives. Oh, I'm afraid I can't Look, help you before there. you brush me off. Sir? I have a note from Viscount Tremaine asking me to come and see him. Oh, a note? Here. Oh, are you Lord Willis? Yes. Oh, I remember the name. You're the writer, Ted Willis. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, you wrote... Uh, Dicks in the Dark Green, correct? And other things. Ah, I'm sorry it's finished. Always used to enjoy it every Saturday night. <laughs> Never missed it. Trevelic. Oh, yes. Uh, take the coast road towards Morver and St. Just. Uh, just before you reach Morver, turn in land on the... For a time, I wondered whether I'd been deliberately misdirected. The track dipped and curved over a vast, desolate moor. And then... As the car struggled to the top of the ridge, I saw it. A house. A long, low and lovely house. It had to be Trevelic. There was a gate across the track and a large forbidding sign to warn off trespassers. I opened the gate nevertheless and turned back to the car. The afternoon sun threw my shadow before me and I had only moved a few paces when I stopped abruptly. Another, longer and broader shadow had linked with mine. I turned. I saw an arm raised, a thick wooden club. I caught a glimpse of a bearded face, and then the blow fell and oh. I went down. As I fell, spinning to the darkness, I dimly heard a voice calling. No! Michael! <laughs> How are you feeling, old chap? Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, you'll be all right. <laughs> no serious injury. Uh, a man hit me. Yeah, Michael. You know him? Oh, he works for me. Has done for a very long time. You see, we're jealous of our privacy, and unfortunately, Michael received a message from some friends in Zello. The pub landlord. Uh, he's a good man and a good friend. He knows that we don't welcome strangers here. It was partly your own fault, you know. Thank you very much. Well, you should have warned me you were coming. Oh, it's our guest. Uh, he'll live. Yeah, this is my wife. Pleased to meet you, Lady Tremaine. I am so sorry about what happened. We brought in your car and your things are here. You will stay with us for a few days, I hope. Well, he has to if he wants to hear the story. Are you sure? Yes, my dear. We've kept silent too long. Soon it may be too late. The whole story? You'll tell the whole story? Everything. Over the next few days, in the quiet peace of their garden, I saw them often. Sometimes Lady Tremaine sat there, quietly listening, while her husband pieced together the story I'd come to hear. But for the most part, she left him alone to tell it in his own way. My wife and I have discussed this oh, many, many times. Where to start? How, how to begin? And we thought, well, it'd be better simply to start right at the beginning. And that means going back to 1918... And a rather important appointment. Captain Tremaine, sir. Thank you, Fielding. You're late, young man. You have an appointment with His Majesty at Buckingham Palace and you're late. I'm sorry about that, sir. I doubt whether His Majesty will be able to see you now. He's with Mr. Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, at this moment. And after that, he has to go on to a dinner at the French Embassy. There'll be no time. Ah, oh, well, in that case... Uh... Wait. I didn't say you were to go... Wait here until I've spoken with His Majesty. Jolly good, sir. If Your Majesty will excuse me. One moment, Stamford. Pray continue, Mr. Prime Minister. I was simply pointing out to Your Majesty that if the public were to learn we were spending time and effort on an attempt to rescue the Tsar, there would be an outcry. And if you were to bring him here to England, there would be riots in the streets. We cannot allow the Tsar to rot or be murdered by the Bolsheviks without lifting a finger. Don't you see? I would consider a rescue attempt, Your Majesty, if the situation in Russia was not so confused. We don't know which army holds what. There is a young man just back from there. 
General Tremaine's son. He was on the ambassador's staff. I was hoping he might bring some word. He's here, sir. Let's have him in, if his majesty wishes. Of course. Bring him, Stamfordham. Sir. This business has been much on my mind of late, Prime Minister. Perhaps I ought to say my conscience. I was wrong not to help last year when the opportunity was there. Now, with the Bolsheviks consolidating their power, pray God we may not be too late. Captain from Maine, Your Majesty. Ah, yes. Welcome, Captain. My humble respects, Your Majesty. He has his father's looks, don't you agree, sir? He is much like him, yes, indeed. Mm. I wish I had a dozen more generals like your father, Captain. Yes, sir. Well, some of the others are pretty bad, aren't they? <laughs> he is like his father. You know Russia? Speak the language, do you? Well, it's hard to know Russia, sir. But the language, yes, I do speak it passably well. Like a native, so I was told. Tell me, Captain, what is your view of the Bolsheviks? I share Mr. Bruce Lockhart's opinion, Your Majesty. We underestimate them at our peril. But they are a small minority, Captain. What of those who oppose them? What of those who support the Tsar? If I may speak frankly, Your Majesty. That is why you are here. Very few support the Tsar. That has to be recognized. As for the so-called white opposition, it is ineffectual. Why? Well, quite simply because the whites have no leaders who can measure up to Lenin or Trotsky. Those monsters. Tell me, Captain, do you think the Bolsheviks will allow the Tsar and the imperial family to leave Russia? Not willingly, no, sir. What do you suppose may happen? I believe... It's only my opinion, sir. Yes, yes. You believe? That they will be executed, sir. Why haven't they been executed already? I think because they're useful as bargaining counters, sir, with the Germans and with the British. Good. Capital. Now, another question. When will the Tsar's usefulness run out? Soon. Quite soon. How soon is soon? Once Germany is defeated. A few months, perhaps. The war will be over by Christmas. Now, where have I heard that before? With respect, sir, the situation is different now. The Germans cannot last much longer. Well, that's why I've come back. I want to get into the action before it's too late. You're proposing to go to France? Yes, sir, to join my regiment. Nonsense, forget it. But, but sir... We can get plenty of officers for France. What we can't get is young men like yourself who know Russia. You're going back there, Captain. With respect, You sir, will either go as a volunteer, or we shall simply order you there. Take your choice. May I be permitted to ask... Captain... Allow me, Prime Minister. Captain Tremaine, we want you to mount and to lead a rescue mission. We want you to go to Russia and bring out the Tsar and his family. Rescue the Tsar? Do you think the task impossible? Nothing is impossible, sir. I can sir. only ask that you do your best. I will see that you're given all the necessary facilities, Captain, but understand two things. First... The mission must be most secret. Second, it must be unofficial. That is to say, if you fail, or if you should be captured, the British government will deny all knowledge of you. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Take this ring, Captain. If you should get to the Tsar, show it to him. He will know you come from me as a friend. He gave it to me in 1912. It belonged to his father. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. May God go with you. Here, here is the ring. You see, I have it still. It's beautiful. Yes. The signet is the Russian Imperial Falcon. The Tsar's personal emblem. Tell me, did you no, ever... no, don't, 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 don't rush me one step at a time. Oh, you can imagine my feelings as I left the palace. In the first place, I thought the mission was crazy, next to impossible. But how do you say no to your king and his prime minister? Mm. Uh, I started making plans, but within a week I had to scrap them. Oh? No, you see, Lenin was holding the imperial family at Tobolsk, just outside Moscow. And then I received word that he had transferred them, lock, stock and barrel, to Siberia. To Sverdlovsk? No, no, it was called Ekaterinburg then. That's how I still think of it, Ekaterinburg. Oh, the Tsar and his family were put into a heavily guarded house. The Bolsheviks called it the House of Special Purpose. Mm. The House of Special Purpose. Are you all right, my dear? I, I think perhaps I will go and rest for a while. Yes, of course. 
don't overtire yourself, dear. No, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I will see you at dinner. Thank you. Now, uh, where was I? Uh, Katerinburg, the House of Special Purpose. Ah, yes, but before I come to that, we must go back a little in time and go west to Petrograd. And introduce a lady who's rather important to the story. A lady? <laughs> an English woman. Well, I'd been sent to Petrograd to study the situation. It was before the Bolshevik takeover and the city was in a turmoil. It seemed as if the entire population had taken to the streets. Yes, miss. Then why are you not at the front like the British soldiers oh, fighting the Germans? Oh, 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 oh. There is no front to speak of. The Germans are driving through almost as they please. We lost three quarters of our men in a month. Oh, Do you know why? Do you know why? Because we have nothing to fight with. No arms, no supplies, no food. But the British soldiers are still fighting on. They haven't deserted. Who are you? Are you one of them? Are you rich, perhaps? Rich? Of course not. I'm an English governess. Oh, an educated person. Oh, yeah. You should know better than to accuse us. Maybe you'd like to see the Tsar back on the throne. Uh, I've nothing against the Tsar. Oh, oh, a oh, no. I didn't say I was a Tsar. Here is someone who loves the Tsar. Here, take my arm. Let's get you out of here. Who are you? But don't argue. Excuse me. Let us through, please. Thank you. That's better. I am quite capable of taking care of myself, thank you. Oh, it didn't look like it. What on earth possessed you to go into that mob? I am a loyal Englishwoman. Those men have deserted their posts while our soldiers fight on, sacrificing their lives. They have reason. You surely don't support them. No, but the Russians are good, brave people. They've been driven to revolution by... Oh, well, never mind. We can't discuss that here. Well, come, let me see you home. I am quite capable of taking care uh, of... I know, so you said... Nevertheless, I'd better see you safely to your door in case you let yourself in for more trouble. Oh, very well, this way. It's only a short distance. I don't even know you. Oh, I do apologize. Somehow in this city at this time, formal introductions seem superfluous. Mm. I am Captain James Tremaine on attachment to the British Embassy. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Captain Tremaine. I fear I may have seemed ungrateful for your help. Oh, not at all. Uh, perhaps I may ask whom I have the honour to... I am Margaret Wellmeadow. My friends call me Meg, I prefer it. I have been here since 1913. I'm a governess to the Rostilo family. You may perhaps know them. I'm afraid not. There's a house. What's that sailor doing at the door? Oh, he's from the Kronstadt fleet. They're trying to keep order in the city. But something's wrong. Something must be wrong. The front door's open and look, that window's smashed. Halt! I have orders to stop anyone entering this house. That's ridiculous. I live here. What's going on? Uh, what has happened here, Comrade Sailor? Who wants to know? Uh, this lady lives here. She is the governess of the family. What's wrong? What's happened? The Harash gang that poses revolutionaries. But they are gangsters. Louts. Oh. They've been looting the houses the and... children! I must see the children! Don't go in there, Missy! Don't! Don't... Ah. Well, I suppose she has to know. Know what? Two people were murdered in there. People called Rostilov. A man and a woman, and a servant was badly beaten up. We got one of the gang and were chasing the others. <sighs> Such things give our revolution a bad name, comrade. Natasha! Misha! Children! Natasha! Misha! Here, miss. Uh, Here, by the stairs. Kolya! Oh, Kolya, you're hurt. Your head's bleeding. I'm all right, miss. The children. I locked them in the attic, told them to hide. Oh, Natasha! Misha! It's me! What will you do now? Do? I can arrange a passage on a ship back to England. England? Uh, no, Mr. Tremaine, I can't go there. Not yet, at least. Not until the children are settled. I shall arrange the funeral and then take the children to Ekaterinburg. Ekaterinburg? Yes. 
That's beyond the Ural Mountains in Siberia. It's hundreds of miles away. The children have an aunt and uncle there. They're only relatives. You can't travel alone with two children. Collier will come with us. I don't know whether you're stupid, stubborn or brave. I really don't. I'm not brave. And I don't like to think of myself as stupid, Mr. Tremaine. Well, let us settle for stubborn, then. If you wish. She left with the two children and Collier uh, the following week to Ekaterinburg. And oddly enough, <laughs> fate is a curious thing, don't you think? Within a few months, I was also on my way to Ekaterinburg. But I approached it from the other direction, from the east, after seven steaming weeks at sea. Mr. Tremaine? Yes? I am from the British High Commission. My name is Maria Starkov. May I perhaps welcome you to Vladivostok? The year is 1978, the summer of 1978. But in the garden of his home in Cornwall, Viscount Tremaine had been telling me about another year and another season, 60 years ago, when, as a young captain attached to the Foreign Office, he was summoned to Buckingham Palace to see His Majesty King George V. You can imagine my feelings, Willis, when I heard why the King had sent for me. Captain Tremaine, we want you to lead a rescue mission. At this moment, the Tsar and his family are in great danger. We want you to go to Russia and bring them to safety. Mission impossible? Well, exactly, or almost impossible. But how do you say no to your king? Anyway, a few weeks after my interview with him, I landed in Vladivostok. In my pocket was a sealed letter to the British High Commissioner, signed by the Prime Minister, Mr. Lloyd George. Mr. Tremaine? Yes? I am from the British High Commissioner. My name is Maria Astakhov. May I perhaps welcome you to Vladivostok? Thank you. I am sorry about the rain. I have a car here. It is not far. Please, to get in. What's your job at the High Commission? I am Second Secretary to the High Commissioner. This is your home? I beg you. You are Russian? Of course, but you speak of home. My home is 7,000 miles away in Novgorod. Whether I shall ever see it again... Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. What the... Stop the car! No, no! Drive on! But Drive on! Those horsemen, they were chasing those people, simply riding them down. But we should have stopped. You would have been killed, Mr. Tremaine. They were Semyonov's men. Semyonov? Ataman Semyonov. He is, uh, how you say, a kind of warlord. Really abandoned. Siberia is full of such men. Now you see for yourself. There is no law, no order here. Ah, here we are. Come on, Mr. Tremaine. The High Commissioner is waiting. I can't believe it. A rescue mission to bring out the Tsar? You? One man? And this note from Lloyd George instructs me to give you the fullest cooperation. Let me paint the full picture for you, Mr. Tremaine. First, we are speaking of Siberia, a country so big that it could swallow the United States and Europe as a main course and still have room for dessert. Second, we are speaking of a wilderness where a dozen armies are fighting each other, where no one can be sure who holds what towns, what territory. Third, we are speaking of a distance of 4,000 miles between here and Ekaterinburg, where the Tsar is imprisoned. That's a journey of ten days in today's conditions, at least ten days. If, and I say if, you can get a train. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, sir. But how can I get a train? Huh? Uh, an armoured train and a crew. An armoured train? You might as well ask for a miracle. I'm going to need the odd miracle before I'm through, sir, don't you think? Hmm. Your only chance is to see the Americans. Yes, the Americans. A thin chance, but there's no alternative. Maria? Yes, sir? Um, what's the name of that American major who's in charge of rolling stop up at the marshalling yards? A major story, I think, sir. That's the fella. Take the car and take Mr. Tremaine to see him, would you?
What do you think, Major? Did you ever see such a train? She's beautiful, Klaus. A real beauty. <laughs> the protective plating, one inch thick. On each side of the engine, we have a machine gun wagon with firing ports for six guns. Then, there is a flatbed truck to hold two Goda machine guns, each protected by one inch steel shields. And last, two armored coaches with rifle ports and gun turrets. I tell you, Major, there is nothing like this train in the whole of Siberia. Yeah, she's beautiful, Klaus. Beautiful. Hands bloody hands, Major. We have a visit. Not a good one. Ataman Semyonov, I think. That madman? You watch him, Klaus. He'd take the sugar out of a blind man's coffee. And then go back for the cream. I don't understand. Mm, never mind. You just watch him. You are the American? Major Story? That's right. Do I come out here? I guess you could say that. Ah. The train. He is magnificent. One thing only I do not like the color is dull. What do you think, Tuchani? As your High Excellency has said, the train is magnificent. The color, the color. It should be white. All white. His High Excellency has a fondness for white. Exactly so. White. Then it would be truly a marvel. Our enemies would see us coming, eh, Tuchani? <laughs> and the people would know who rules here. Exactly so, your High Excellency. <laughs> white, Tuchani. Make the arrangement with the American. Sorry, General, no dice. You do not understand. I wish to buy the train. No sale. Oh, please do not make trouble for yourself, Major. I will pay you well. In Kerensky money, if you wish, or both. I said no sale, General. That is a pity. You see, if I wish, I could kill you and take the train. I'm a man of thrift, and the idea appeals to me. On the other hand, I'm a man of honor also, so I will buy the train at a fair price. What do you say? General, maybe you didn't understand me. I'll give it to you once more. This particular piece of rolling stock has been bought and paid for by the government of the U.S. of A. You might say it belongs to President Wilson. It is not for sale. You give me no choice. To come in, call up a platoon of men, commandeer the train. Excellent. If these men interfere, kill them. I shouldn't make a move if I were you. Hold, what, what, devil? Hold it. Stand very still. Now call your man back, General, or this gun may go off. First bullet will blow your head off. Leave it, Dukhonin, leave it. Good. Now, I suggest you get in your magnificent white car and go quickly. You are the Englishman. James Tremaine, is that not so? You arrived this morning. Well, congratulations. Your intelligence service seems to be working well, General. I shall remember you, Mr. Tremaine. Well, thanks. Send me a card at Christmas. Hmm. Unpleasant fellow, don't you think? Yeah. Well, thanks for your help. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, don't get the wrong idea. Klaus and me could have handled the situation. Yeah. No, I'm sure. It was simply that I was worried that Semyonov might take the train. And why should that bother you? Oh, because I need it myself, old chap. Rather urgently, as a matter of fact. Hell's bloody bents. But luckily, Lloyd George had taken the precaution of consulting President Wilson about the mission. And when story became obstinate... I arranged for us to talk to Admiral Austin Knight, commander-in-chief of the American Asiatic Fleet. His flagship, the USS Brooklyn, was in Vladivostok Harbor. <laughs> Story turned out to be quite a character. Story, Admiral, sir. You wanted to see me? At ease, Major. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Admiral. How long have you been in the Army, Major? You want the truth? I was never really in the Army, Admiral. Wouldn't know how to salute for a thousand bucks. Well, this here Major business is phony. I was given the honorary rank soon after the Reds took over in Russia, just to make things easier, I guess. Before that, I was working here for the railway company as chief engineer. Mm, so uh, you know this place well. Uh, Vlad? Well, I reckon I know it as well as anyone can. And how well do you know the Trans-Siberian Railway, Major? Oh, pretty well, I guess. Been over the track all the way, half a dozen times, maybe more. Hey, but listen, if you think... Hold it, be... Major. I have an assignment for you. And it comes on direct authority of Washington. Well, sure, Admiral. Anything Washington says... You or... will have an armored train ready to leave Vlad within the next 24 hours. To go where? You will be informed in due course. All I can say at this stage is that you'll be going west. Uh, the train? Uh, how big? How many wagons? Mr. Tremaine? Well, sufficient to take a detachment of 24 United States Marines, a Russian officer and his staff, 50 Russian cavalrymen mm -hmm. and their horses, and myself. You mean you're coming along? I shall be in command, old chap. You mean to tell me this limey 
Uh, sorry, no offense, mister. Uh, you mean he gives the orders? Yes, that's the general idea, Major. We'll get along splendidly, I'm sure. Well, I don't know. One thing, I'll, uh, I'll have to take Klaus along. The German? The man who was with you at the yards? He's a prisoner of war. I picked him up at the camp at Harborovsk. That was highly irregular? Well, hell, Admiral, it's an irregular sort of war. I was short of engineers, so I went looking. Klaus is the best, I'm telling you. What do you say, Mr. Tremaine? Well, we need all the good men we can get. Okay. Give him the stripes, Major, and tell him he's an honorary sergeant in the U.S. Army. Oh, he's sure going to like that. <laughs> uh, was there anything else? Uh, yes, this uh, this Russian officer you mentioned, who's he? A man called Zakhar Kazakov, uh, Colonel Kazakov. I've heard of him. You've met him once, I think. He's got a wild reputation. He's in this with you? Well, not yet, Admiral, but he will be, I think. The High Commissioner has arranged for Mr. Starkov to bring him to my hotel tonight. Come in. Ah, good evening, Mr. Starkov. Good evening. I should like to present Colonel Kasakov of the Imperial Chevalier Guards. Colonel Kasakov, Mr. Tremaine. Delighted to meet you, Colonel. It is my pleasure also, Mr. Tremaine. I see that you've brought an escort with you. I assure you it's not necessary. I would prefer to talk alone. You do not like my Circassian guards? They are devoted to well, me. All the same. I... As you please. I shall leave you also, I think. That is not necessary, my dear. It will be better. If there is anything further you want, Mr. Tremaine, you know where to find well, me. Perhaps... I mean, well, perhaps we could meet later. There may be one or two things arising from my talk with Colonel Kazakov. That is, if you are free, of course. I will meet you in the lobby in, shall we say, one hour? She is a very beautiful woman. What? Oh, yes, quite attractive. Uh, we received your plan in London, Colonel. It was most interesting. Mm. That's why I'm here. We are prepared to cooperate. Under certain conditions. Conditions. Always conditions. The British government is not to be involved officially. Of course, I expected as much. A strange people, you British. So straightforward in small things, so devious in big ones. And the other conditions? Well, the actual rescue must be undertaken by Russians, loyal to the Tsar, as you indicated in your plan. That will be no problem. I have a hundred good men who are prepared to give their lives for His Imperial Majesty. A hundred? Two hundred, three hundred, a thousand, if you wish. Uh, no, Colonel. Fifty will be enough. The more people we use, the greater the danger of discovery, betrayal. My men may be trusted absolutely. Some of them have fought their way across thousands of miles to join this enterprise. The majority of them are Georgians from the Circassian horse regiments and my own Chevalier Guard. The Circassians? The Wild Squadron? Ah, you have heard of them. You will then know that they are the best, most fearless fighters in the world. Fierce, yet disciplined. And all have sworn an oath to serve his imperial majesty unto death. We know what we have to do, Mr. Tremaine. What about you? It is arranged. A gunboat, HMS Chatham, will berth in the Gulf of Obskaya. After the rescue, the imperial family will be taken southwards towards Omsk. Southwards? Uh, that will be a feint. At Tarlitza, we shall turn north and strike across country to the River Ob. A riverboat will be waiting to take the Imperial family upriver to HMS Chatham. Chatham will then steam into the Kara Sea and head for Archangel, where the entire party will embark on a British cruiser. Good. Good. I like it. The train... It has been arranged. There is one further condition, Colonel. I might have known it. I am not coming just for the ride. I am to be completely involved in the planning of the operation and its execution. That is not necessary. It is essential. Let me put it this way, Colonel. Last year, a group of well-meaning patriots made an attempt to rescue the Tsar when he was imprisoned at Tobolsk. Mm. The idea was bold and imaginative. The planning and execution, diabolical. So, it comes to this. We are to imitate the Bolsheviks. I will play the commander and you will play the commissar. If you wish to put it like that. The Bolsheviks appoint commissars because very often they do not trust their military commanders. I take it you don't trust me. I don't know you, Colonel. Nor are you. Then we start on even terms. <laughs> <laughs> so be it. When will your British gunboat be at the mouth of the orb? In exactly 12 days. And it will wait three days. No more. Then we have 15 days. 
Only 15 days. When do we leave? Now, you and I will meet here at 8 in the morning to check the final details. And then, if all goes well, we leave at noon. Ah, yes. I am forgetting. Tonight is precious for you. You have an engagement with the so delightful Miss Maria Stockhoff. I merely arranged No that apologies she... necessary, I assure you. What is your proverb? Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Good night, Mr. Tremaine. Mr. Tremaine! Mr. Tremaine! Mr. Starkov, I'm sorry, I, I didn't... Gosh! Oh, gosh. What is wrong? We, wrong? Oh, oh, nothing's wrong. I, I, I didn't expect you to have changed. That dress, your, your hair, you look absolutely marvellous. Thank you. But I, I mustn't keep you. Obviously, you have an engagement for this evening. I was going to suggest that we might have dinner, but... No. Um, well, I quite understand, of course. No. I mean, I am not engaged for this evening. It would be a happiness to join you. Marvellous! Absolutely stunning! Shall we find the restaurant? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Now, for your pleasure and delight, the famous Romany singer, Miss Lydia Elmer. Oh. <laughs> Oh, what's the song? Stjenka Razin was a great Cossack hero who dared to fall in love with the daughter of a nobleman. He was pursued to the Volga and rather than surrender, he drowned him. Oh, very romantic. Don't you believe in the romance? Well, of course. I'm incurable. If you wish, I'll prove it. Shh. As your depths when twilight comes, freedom, freedom is thy curse. As your depths when twilight comes, freedom, freedom is thy curse. Mother Volga, Mother Volga. Beautiful as that strong, least or least thee now to rosin, hearken to my Cossack song. Trembling. Are you all right? Yes. I'm sorry. It is the song, the singing, everything. The last time I am hearing Lydia Elman was in Moscow. So much has happened since then. I, I'm sorry. I don't feel... It's very warm in here, don't you think? And rather noisy. Well, we could, I mean, if you'd like to, we could go up to my room, have um, something sent up. I would like that. I was a fool. I should have known better. Kept my mind on the business ahead. <laughs> Instead, I allowed myself to be taken in by those big black eyes. <laughs> Not for the first time, I may add. <laughs> what went wrong? Well, in the early morning, she stayed on, of course. I woke up to find her going through my document case. 
I watched her. There was nothing in the case of any significance, and I wanted to see what she was up to. She locked the case, put the keys back in my jacket pocket, and began to dress. Well, I pretended to be asleep when she left. She was a spy. Of course. Blind Freddy could have seen that. But who was she working for? What was the question? Colonel Kazakov. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, my friend. You seem in a good mood this morning, Colonel. I am? I am. I owe you an apology. Why? Last night I met Count Malkov. He remembers you well from Moscow and Petrograd. He knew you as James Ivanovich. Ah. It seems you helped him and many others to get away. Last evening when we met, I did not know this, and I did not treat you with the proper respect. So, I apologize, James Ivanovich. You did not treat me with the proper respect last night, either, Colonel. Excuse me, please. I do not understand. Maria Astakov. What about her? She works for you, of course. What are you talking about? She works for the British High Commission. My friend, what has happened? Tell me, this could be serious. Well, she stayed here last night. I woke this morning and found her going through my documents. <sighs> you challenged her? No, I thought it better not to put her on her guard. As a matter of fact, I thought she was working for you. You should have killed the bitch. Oh, now, hang on. <laughs> she is working for the Bolsheviks, that is clear. Uh, no, that is hardly possible. Everything is possible in Russia. The Reds have their agents everywhere. Oh, my friend, this could be bad. If the Bolsheviks got to hear of our mission... Well, she's learned nothing from me. The papers she saw were just a cover. We can take no chances. Do not worry. I will see to it she does not trouble us further. My Circassians will take care of that. We leave at noon, as arranged? As arranged. Hey, Klaus, you all set? What? I said you all set. Yes, sir. All set. Uh, good morning, Major. Are we ready to go? As ready as we'll ever be. Well, Colonel Kasakov should be here with his Circassians. It's almost noon. Hey, listen, Klaus and me, we're just trying to work out a name for the train. The train's got to have a name, you see. Yeah. How would this be? We call it the Yankee. Yankee? Where I come from, that's a dirty word. Well, then I have another suggestion. Yeah, let's have it. I remember you are telling me about the time in New Orleans when you are playing poker and you hold a royal flush. Ah, yeah, it was one of the great moments of my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew I had a cinch hand, so I bet the limit. Now, the other guy raised, and we went on like that for ten minutes before he finally called me. He was holding the straight. <laughs> Yeah, it took nearly 2,000 bucks from that pot. <laughs> Do you know, Mr. Tremaine, the chance of a player being dealt a royal flush is almost 650,000 to one. So, that is what we call the train, yeah? The royal flush. Hang on. I will paint up the boards. Well, James Ivanovich, we are here. Uh, I want your men in the two end wagons. Uh, the horse wagons are in between. Can you move quickly? As you wish, of course. This is Captain Samarin, my personal aide. Samarin, you heard? Get the men and horses aboard. Sir! By the way, James Ivanovich, I was right. About what? The girl, Maria Astakov. She was working for the Bolsheviks. How did you find out? My Circassians persuaded her to confess. Did you hand her over to the authorities? Alas, no. We had intended to do so, of course, but unfortunately she had a... well... A sort of heart attack and died. Quite suddenly. Most unfortunate. I could imagine what had happened. For a long time afterwards, my dreams were haunted by visions of that beautiful young girl who'd been caught up in the wildness of those strange times. At any rate, no damage had been done to our cause, and I was ready to go a train, a crew, and a dedicated band of armed men. But the news from Ekaterinburg wasn't good. It made our timetable look inadequate in the extreme. Lenin had sent a special emissary to the town to take charge, as he put it, of the Romanov problem. The local Soviet, led by their chairman, Viktor Gromyko, didn't take kindly to what they saw as outside interference. Come in, come in, comrade. It's good to see you. I have certain questions to put to you, Comrade Commissar. If I can be of help, Comrade Chairman. I have come from a meeting of the regional Soviet. We are concerned about the Romanovs. There are rumors that you intend to move them. And that depends on the military situation. As you know, a white army under Dieterichs is within 80 miles of the town. If they advance further, I have orders to move the Imperial family to another destination. 
Comrade Commissar, the regional Soviet instructed me to inform you of its wish that the family should be brought before a revolutionary tribunal in Ekaterinburg for immediate trial and execution. We passed a resolution to that effect. A trial at this time is not possible. We have transmitted the resolution to Moscow. Until we receive a reply, I've been asked to request you not to attempt to move the prisoners from the House of Special Purpose. Request? That is what I said, Comrade Commissar. And if I choose to obey the orders I was given? With respect, Comrade Commissar, we shall be forced to take certain steps. To put it bluntly, we shall stop you. I could have you arrested and shot for this, comrade. Perhaps. But you would also have to shoot the entire regional Soviet and most of the Red Guards. We are simple people here in Ekaterinburg, comrade commissar. Call us ignorant if you wish. But we know who our enemies are and how to deal with them. Listen, comrade, you're tired. I haven't slept for almost three days. The situation is... Exactly. So why don't you take some rest? Then we'll talk again. And don't worry, Nicholas will pay for his bloody crimes, never fear. Lenin will see to that. He doesn't love him any more than you do, but he has other things to consider. He wants to put Nicholas on trial in his own good time. And in Moscow, comrade, don't you see, a big, big trial where the whole world will see and hear. The people here don't understand about Moscow. Or what goes on in the heads of the Moscow people? Make them understand, comrade. Can you talk to an avalanche? No. My people have had enough. Depend upon it, comrade commissar. They will never allow Nicholas the Bloody to leave Ekaterinburg alive. The news from Ekaterinburg wasn't good. A white army was nearing the town, and we were afraid that the Bolsheviks would kill the Tsar and his family rather than allow them to be I'm saved by the If you don't mind, Tremaine. Mm? Yes? Before you go on, I'd just like to check back on a few things. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, would you say this was a fair summary of the events so far? The year is 1918. You've been sent to Siberia to attempt to rescue the Russian royal family who are being held by the Bolsheviks. In Ekaterinburg. Right. You land in Vladivostok, and with the help of the Americans, you obtain the use of an armoured train. The Royal Flush. Tom Story, an American railroad expert, joins up with you, and you gain the support also of Colonel Kosakov, a fanatical young Tsarist officer. Mm. With 50 of Kosakov's troops aboard and 24 American Marines, you start the 4,000-mile journey to Ekaterinburg. Now, I know I've left out a lot of detail, but would you agree with that as a sort of summary? This is fair enough. The only problem is that it makes no mention of Miss Meg. Oh, the English government? Yes. I told you she plays rather an important part in the story. So, while the Royal Flush is steaming westward, so to speak, on the first stage of our journey, let's return to Miss Meg. Now, when her employer and his wife were killed in Petrograd, she'd taken the two orphan children to their Aunt Sophie in Ekaterinburg only to find that she'd walked into a trap in more ways than one. I'm afraid I can't help you, Miss Wellmeadow. But you are still British consul in Ekaterinburg, are you not? Yes, but the local Soviets do not recognize either my position or my authority. Oh, you must insist that they allow me to take the children and go east to Vladivostok. I am told there are British troops there and units of the Royal Navy. Even if they listened to me, which I doubt, they would not be able to help you. But... The town is virtually surrounded by the white armies. It could fall within a few days. The uh, children you speak of, they're yours? Certainly not, but they are in my charge. Their parents died in Petrograd, so I brought them here to their aunt. But she was taken also by the typhus, so they have nobody. I cannot abandon them. I'm sorry if I could help. Oh, there seems to be no end to it all. On my way here, I passed the house in which the Tsar is imprisoned. The house of special purpose? Yes. Are the Imperial family still safe? I believe so. In fact, I think their conditions have improved somewhat since the new commissar came from Moscow. The sisters from the Convent of the Resurrection are allowed to take fresh food to them each morning. Oh, that is something, at least. Was the Tsar really so bad? Was he a despot, a tyrant, as they say? Terrifying things were done in his name. His rule was despotic. As for the man himself, oh, what happened was not his fault entirely. He was just a prisoner of the system and of his royal upbringing. I feel ashamed that I should complain of my situation. At least I have my freedom. Open up. Open up. 
Yes. Who lives here? I live here. You're a child. Who else? Miss Meg and Colia, our servant. And servant? My brother. Don't you know that there are no servants in Russia anymore? All that has been abolished. What is going on, Natasha? There's a soldier here, Miss Meg. What? Do you want? Everybody is commanded to assemble on the street in one hour. You will bring tools for digging, spades, that sort of thing. The order cannot apply to me. I am a British... No citizen. exceptions. What? I... You live here. You draw your ration so you can work also. Anyone failing to report will be shot without mercy. In one hour, comrade. Oh. What, comrades? Quiet, if you please. I'm not your comrade. First... Comrades, let me introduce myself. My name is Nikolai Dukov, Deputy Commander of the 2nd Battalion of the Ekaterinburg Red Guard. He's only a boy. Can't be much more than 20. <laughs> but good-looking. Quite handsome, in fact. Comrades, our people's revolution is in danger. The counter-revolutionary armies of the whites are threatening our city. The Red Guard of the revolution need your help. Oh, we all need help. Accordingly... The Soviet of Soldier and Worker Deputies of Ekaterinburg has issued the following order. All able-bodied men and women and young people between the ages of 12 and 70 are hereby called to service for the digging of trenches and the erection of barricades. Workers, soldiers, citizens, defend Ekaterinburg. Drive back the enemy. Long live the revolution! Don't you think we have enough to do? If you want trenches, dig them. Do yes, you right. want the whites to come? I oh. want peace. You lot promised us peace. That's mm. all I want. Peace! Peace! peace. 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 What? What? Peace. You should be ashamed. Our comrades gave their blood for the revolution. Many have died. Uh, have you forgotten what it was like under the Tsar? Uh, do you want to go back to that? Do you understand what the whites will do to you if they capture the town? He's right. Come on, let's get on with it. Arise, ye starlings from your slumbers. Arise, ye criminals of want. For reason in Stand clear! Backs into it. Get the tree over to that trench. What the devil? Who fired those shots? What's going on? It's one of the work party, Comrade Commander. I caught him trying to escape. No, no, they've got it wrong, I assure you. I went into the woods simply to obey a call of nature. Liar! It's the truth, I swear. Liar! It. When I shouted at him, he took off like a hare. Only stopped when I fired over his head, and look what I found on him, Comrade Commander. A revolver. <laughs> A oh, pretty little thing. More like a toy. But it is loaded. Do you know the penalty for carrying arms without a permit? It is for protection, nothing more. I am not an enemy, believe me. Why did you run away, then? I, I, I was frightened when the guard shouted. I knew him. A bloodsucker. He bled the workers. Yes. Yes. All right, take him away. Hand him over to the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hand him up. No! Who the devil are you? Never mind that. You know what will happen if this man goes before the tribunal? Yes, I'll probably shoot him. Can't you give him another chance? Ah, I know you now. The English governess. We have a request for clemency from the English governess. Ah! <laughs> Isn't it obvious that this gentleman, I mean this citizen, had a moment of panic, nothing more? Oh, please. I see. Well, what do you think, comrades? Shall we show our English lady that the Soviets know how to temper justice with mercy? Yes. No objections? Good. Take the prisoner back to the trenches and see that he does a double shift. Yes, Comrade Commander. Ah, thank you. Thank you. All right, back to work now. Back to work. You see, we're not devils. Thank you very much. Uh, don't go. I've been watching you. You work well. Come, we have a samovar over in the clearing. I'll get you some tea and rice cakes. What is your name? Margaret. Margaret Wellmeadow. Margaret Wellmeadow. I am usually called Meg or Miss Meg. No, I prefer Margaret. It's more, how shall I say, more poetic. Oh. Uh, 
my name is Nikolai. Nikolai Dukov. I know. Sit here on this log for a moment. <laughs> Come on. You've earned a moment of rest. Here you are, comrades. Thank you. Well, then. Margaret. <laughs> yeah, we shall be friends, eh? What do you think? Perhaps. <laughs> Not very enthusiastic, eh? You don't like me. I didn't say that. Then you don't like our revolution, is that it? I don't like violence. All this bloodshed. You talk of freedom, of liberty, but you can script people. You hunt down and imprison or kill those who don't agree with you. I most certainly don't like that. You don't understand. But I will tell you this. When we have thrown out the enemies of the revolution, then you will see a Russia that will surprise the world. We have everything here. Raw materials, resources, space, a people rich in talent. Yes. Oh, yes. We shall no longer be working for a boss or for the Tsar. We shall be working for ourselves. Now it is our Russia, ours. It's not quite yours, not yet. Ah, you make me sick. You're all the same, you petty bourgeoisie. No, don't be angry. I would like to understand. I know you believe in what you say, and I admire your idealism. It's just that... The violence. I... Yes. I don't like it either. But our enemies leave us no alternative. We must meet force with force, terror with terror. I have never known anything good to be born out of terror. Oh, you're so British. <laughs> you have an answer for everything. I like you. I like your spirit. Yes, well, I'd better get back to work before you have me shot for malingering. No, wait. Here. Take this. The revolver we took from the prisoner. I don't want that. And in any case, it isn't yours to give away. Oh, do all English women argue as you do? Take it, I say, for protection. Before you leave here, I will give you an official permit allowing you to carry this weapon. Come on, take it. You'll have to teach me how to fire it. <laughs> it will be my pleasure. Uh, hmm. Well, really? <laughs> A kiss. Now, what's wrong with that? I simply wanted to set a seal on Anglo-Soviet relations. Wasn't so bad, was it? No. <laughs> you see, Bolsheviks are human too. We'll meet again, I'm sure. Soon. Au revoir, Margaret. Really? While all this was going on, the Royal Flush was making good time out of Vladivostok. Klaus, the German, was at the controls, nursing the locomotive along at a good 20 to 25 miles an hour, <laughs> which, considering the sheer weight of metal she was carrying, wasn't that going. Mm -hmm. Ah, here comes my wife. You know, bless her, for some reason she thinks that sitting in the open air is a health hazard. <laughs> Dear, mm -hmm. I think you'd better come into the house now. Our guest must be feeling the chill. No, I'm feeling fine, thank you, Lady Tremaine. You were, what was the time, my dear? Almost six o'clock. Oh, good Lord. Well, perhaps we will go in and help ourselves to a drink before dinner. What do you say? I'd like that. Yeah, come along, then. <sighs> uh, as I was saying, the Royal Flush was making good progress. We were running through the Kexia Mountains. Magnificent setting, believe me. I was talking to Colonel Kasarkov, making plans, when suddenly... <laughs> Bells, bloody bells. What's going on, Klaus? What the hell have you stuck? Take a look up the track. The line is blocked. Surely is some barricade, all right. Must be a dozen trees piled up there. Somebody must be anxious to stop it. Uh, ring the alarm bells in the coaches, Klaus. Get the men to stand ready to repel boarders. Sure thing. Yeah, take a look through the glasses over by that clump of trees. What do you make of it? A horseman carrying a white flag and coming towards us. You recognize him? Yes, he's the man who was with Semyonov when he tried to take the train. What did he call him? Tukhonin? Uh, yeah, Semyonov's sidekick. Semyonov is a persistent cuss. you got to give him that. <laughs> Hi. Good-looking horse you got there. I have a message for you from His High Excellency, the Ottoman Semyonov. I'm listening. His High Excellency urgently requires your train for certain military operations. He looks upon America as his friend. And it is not his wish to spill American blood. Well, that makes two of us. Then, it is agreed. No, sir, it is not agreed. You go tell your adamant to take a run and jump, preferably off the top of one of them mountains up there. I have more than a thousand men with me. You cannot go forward 
And I have to tell you that around the bend behind you, my men are already blocking off the line. So you see, we have you in our hands, so to speak. Hey, now look, buddy. I'm going to give you one minute to get back to those trees. One minute, and I'll start shooting. As you wish. Tremaine, I'll be honest any second. You and Kasakov, hold them off best you can. Klaus, yeah. I want you to back off. Put her in reverse. But that man just said the track is also blocked behind us. Yeah, I know, I know. But take her back as far as you can. What are you going to do? We're going to try to shift that barricade. Here they come. Back her up, Klaus. Back her up. Watch it, Story. Behind you, on the tender. Thanks. Okay, that'll do, Klaus. Over there. Got a full head of steam? You bet you. Right. I get the word. I want you to drive straight at that barricade. Straight at the barricade? You heard. Hell spells. It could derail the train. Well, we got to take that chance. Right, Klaus? Center forward. Come on. Come on. We won't make it. We got to make it. Come on, Come on. Come We're through. We made it. We made it. Okay, give it all you got, Klaus. Let's get the hell out of here. You bet you. Well, Colonel Kasakov. Six dead, four wounded. Not so bad. Well, Semyonov must have lost close to a hundred. We'll be in Habarovsk in an hour. Never stop there to make a thorough check. No, we must push on. In the dark at night? Why not? Oh, hell, man. A couple hours, maybe three. Is that going to make so much difference? No, we can't afford to lose a minute. You make it sound mighty important. It is, old chap. It is. Well, so tell me, for heaven's sake. I'm supposed to be running this here train, and I don't even know how far we're going or where to. We are going to a Katerinburg, Major, or as close to it as we damn well can. Wow. Exactly. A yeah, Katerinburg? But the Reds are there, isn't that so? I said as near as we can get. How soon do you think you can make it? Well, hell, man, figure it out for yourself. Katerinburg is close to 4,000 miles down the line. We'll have a hard time to make it in 10 days, Colonel. And that's provided we have a free run. No more ambush. In fact, it took us 12 days to reach Omsk, the headquarters of the White Army Forces. Uh, how's that whiskey, by the way? Oh, it's fine, thanks. Well, I help yourself when you want another. I, I never take more than one uh, before dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 12 days to Omsk. Just a few hundred miles from Ekaterinburg. Well, it wasn't the fault of Klaus or the Royal Flush. The line was in a bad way. We had to forage for food for the men and the horses, and we had the old skirmish with bandits. <laughs> Omsk was like another world. Hmm? Seemed they'd never heard of the war. And as we steamed across the bridge over the River Ertish, we could see officers in white uniforms, hmm. ladies with parasols, children all lining the banks. What were they doing? Now, what in all hell is going on now? Boat race. Oh, now I've seen everything. Don't they know that the Reds are up ahead only two or three hundred miles away? Probably a couple of regimental crews. Even soldiers have to relax sometimes. Eh, maybe. But I'll tell you something, mister. I'll lay long odds that Lenin and Trotsky ain't doing any rowing right now. I tell you, man, after what we've seen on this trip, I figure that the Bolshies are a cinch to win. Ah! We have a Bolshevik in our ranks. I'm sorry, Major Story, but I could not help but hear you. I'm surprised. Well, you want the truth, Colonel Kasakov? It is usually better to speak truth. Well, the truth is, I hate the bastards' guts. Lenin, Trotsky, the whole shebang. My hunch is that they'll win. They're tough, organized, and, as of this moment, they're playing the right music. Not the Bolshevik, but the defeatist. Nope, I'm just trying to look at things for real. See, I think your side needs glasses, Colonel. Good glasses. Because from where I'm standing, it seems to me you can't see a damn thing. For example? Yeah, like this, for example. For years, since way back, your king, your czar... The czar. Easy to talk. I'm not fighting, I'm just talking. You mentioned the czar. Now, you got a great country here. But your czar carried on like he was God Almighty. And all the Joe Dokes are Russian. Uh, the ordinary little guys. Well, he treated them like they was all dirt under his feet. You are an expert, perhaps. Well, I've been here four years, and I've seen it. And I don't need to be no expert. So comes the time when the little guys wake up and say, Hell, what kind of a life is this? We got no rights, we got nothing. 
Now, they wasn't asking for much, just to have enough to eat, maybe a Congress or a Parliament where they could speak their piece. What did your czar do? Time and time again, he told them to go to hell, and that made the perfect setup for the Reds. And you blame the Tsar for this situation? Well, sure as hell, he's got to take some of the blame. I got no personal feelings against him. You want the truth? The way he's placed now? I kind of feel sorry for the poor little bastard. What did you say? Uh, I said, uh, I feel sorry for the poor little bastard. His Imperial Majesty is not here to defend himself, Major Story. And I have another, more urgent task to attend to at this time. But when that has been brought to a successful conclusion, and if we should meet again, I will call you out in the name of His Imperial Majesty and kill you. Call me out? <laughs> Was he kidding? I hardly think so. You called his Tsar a bastard. A poor little bastard. The difference is not significant. You have to remember that to Kasakov and his men, the Tsar is a kind of god. To call the Tsar a bastard in front of the colonel is like... It's like fornicating in church. Oh. oh. Yeah. Well, I guess I just learned something. Good. Keep on learning while you can. Oh, cut it out. You know what I'm talking about. Do I? For heaven's sake. You, the Colonel, and Catherine Berg, it all fits. There's got to be only one reason why you want to get there so fast. You're going to try and snatch his imperial majesty. Czar of all the Russians, etc., etc., right? Well, now... I suppose you might call that a reasonable deduction. Well? Uh, just keep it under your thatch, will you, old boy? Ah, uh, you must be crazy. Him, Colonel Kosakoff, uh, him I can understand. Like you said, with him it's a, uh, it's a religion. But why are you risking your neck to save the Tsar? Maybe I'm like you, Tom. I feel sorry for the poor little bastard. How far to go now? I reckon we're about 30 miles from the Katrinburg. Right. See that forest up ahead? Uh, pull in there. The plan is to cut through the forest to the Bakura Marsh. No one will expect an approach from that direction. The marsh is virtually impassable, but Samarin knows a way. Are your men ready, Colonel? They are more than ready. They're wearing the captured Red Army uniforms? Yes. They didn't take kindly to the idea. It is a matter of pride, you understand. We can't afford that sort of luxury at this time. Uh, we'll stop in a few moments. Now, tell them to disembark the horses as quickly and quietly as possible and take cover in the forest. Are there any more orders? Uh, not for the moment. Uh, here, Klaus, here. Uh, this will do us. Stop here. <laughs> Well, Tom, this is it then. Yep, over the top and best of luck, as they say. Thanks, Klaus. It was a pleasure, I think. Have a good trip back, Tom. Well, now, uh, I've been doing a bit of head work on that. Klaus and me, and the sergeant of Marines, had a little talk last night. We figured we wouldn't start back. But you can't stay here. No, I guess not. Well, you're not thinking of... Oh, now, listen... Your orders are to head back east to Vladivostok. Oh, no. Now, we carried out our orders already. We got you here. What we do from now on is none of your goddamn business. Okay? What are you going to do? Well, we are thinking we have come so far, it would be a pity if we do not take a look at a Catherine Bird. You're crazy. Maybe. But I'll tell you something, Jimmy boy. I reckon Klaus and me are holding a lot better hand than you are. I mean, what do you got? A colonel and his bunch of screwballs. Boy, that's, a, that's a subway hand if ever I saw. So low, it ain't even worth a bet. Thanks for your encouragement. Would you mind telling me what you've got? we got a train. And we're Americans. Official Americans. We're neutrals. Well, you know that. I know that. But do the Reds know it? Ah, oh, hell, didn't President Wilson lay it on the line? No military intervention by the U.S. of A. in Russia's internal affairs. Now, that's what the President said. And I got a signed paper from Admiral Knight to prove it. Tom, look... There's nothing more you can do here. Far more sensible for you to head back to arms. Eh, if we were sensible folk, we wouldn't be here. The way I figure it, Jimmy, we just might be able to shorten the odds. For you. I mean, suppose you pull off what you came to do. How are you going to get out? We'll head north, up the river Ob. It's all organized. Yeah, sure, sure. But things can go wrong. So I'll tell you what. We'll hang around for a couple of days. We'll go into a Katherineburg, first of all. Uh, that'll keep them busy, wondering about us, wondering what we're doing. While you get on with uh, what you have to do, we'll stay for, say, uh, 24 hours, and then we'll head back. 
and we'll wait here at this spot for another 24 hours. Uh, just in case you find you need us. If you don't show in that time, we'll beat it. Okay? It's a risk, Tom. Well, I've seen worse risks in a game of cards. See you, Jimmy. Yeah. See you. Good luck. Well, he's the one who needs the luck. Uh, Hell space. The British are a very peculiar people. Hey, listen, Klaus, I've been thinking. Uh, before we move on, you'd better get rid of that nameplate. You don't like it? Sure. In these parts, folks might get the wrong idea if they see a locomotive called the Royal Flush. They don't look on anything royal with too much favor. They are Russian. They cannot read English. Well, we just might run into some awkward cuss who can. Halt! Halt! What's wrong? One of our scouts coming in. What is it, Samari? A Red Army patrol up ahead, Colonel. How many men? Ten in all. Ten. We can take them easily. No. How far are we from the town, Samarin? Twelve miles. I'll deal with the patrol. Leave it to me. Not a word from anyone. Let me do the talking. I'll be ready to jump them if it goes wrong. Good day, comrade. Uh, greetings, comrade. Who are you? What are you doing here? We're from Tobolsk, brother. Ninth Partisan Brigade. We've been through it, I can tell you. But how did you get here? Well, we came across the Pakora Marsh. There's no way across the marsh. It's impossible. You local, brother? No. No, we're from Pam. Oh, they don't speak of what you don't know. We have a local man with us. He knows the way across the marsh. It's just as well he did. The whites were on our tails. It looks as if they're planning to creep up on you with some sort of surprise attack. Ah, then they must think we're idiots. We'll make it hot for them if they come that way. We're going to rest up and then report to the local commander. Good. We can do with more men. The whites are pressing hard from the south. Well, goodbye, comrade, and good luck. Good luck to you. Good luck. I would have liked to cut his red throat. Shh, shh. You look no more than a child, if that's what we're up against. Now, don't underestimate them, Colonel. Because if you do, we are dead. Right. It's time to be moving. It'll be dark in two hours. Twelve miles from the town. Only twelve miles away from the Tsar. It's like a miracle. Yeah, perhaps. I just hope we haven't used up our supply of miracles. We're going to need one or two more before we're finished. That was a marvellous dinner, Lady Tremaine. Hmm? Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Does it all herself, you know. She's always been a superb cook. Not always, sir. There was a time when... Uh, well, we won't go into that now. Mm. I leave you two men to continue your talk. And don't overdo it, James. Oh. Don't tire yourself too much. I should say that he doesn't do that. You find the story interesting, Lord Willis? That's hardly the word. It's absolutely fascinating. Good. I'll say good night, then. Good night. And I'll see you in the morning. Mm -hmm. Good night, dear. Good night, my dear. Well, we might as well make ourselves comfortable in the armchairs, don't you think? Yes. Ah, that's better. Now, where were we? Well, we'd, we'd reached the point where you and Colonel Kosarkov had arrived on the outskirts of Ekaterinburg mm. on the last stage of your attempt to rescue the Tsar. You were disguised as Soviet partisans. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and we were fortunate in that one of Kosarkov's officers, uh, Captain Paul Samarin, was a local man, knew the town well. So we decided to bivouac for the night in an old monastery, and Paul Samarin led the way. You're sure it's not occupied, Paul? I can't be absolutely sure, of course. After the monks left, it was used as a Japanese trading post. But then the Japs left also. It remained empty. Ah, you see the white villa over there, just beyond the trees. But with the red flag flying from the flagpole? That's the one. That was our house. That's where my family lived each summer. The monastery is just ahead, beyond the copse. Wait! Hold the column! Hold! Listen, Paul. Why are we stopped? Listen, it's coming from the direction of the monastery. Damn! But then it could be occupied. Come with me, Paul. We recognize our YouTube boy. I'll come with you. Hold it. 
two guards on the gate. Well, stay here and keep your eye on them. I'll work my way round to the side by the wall. Take a look from there. Mm. They're cooking a sheep. I can smell it from here. It makes me realize how hungry I am. I'm starving. A few slices of mutton go down very nicely. Well, perhaps you will be lucky. Who knows? Wojtek, get back to the troop. Bring the men up quietly and get them stationed along the wall so that they surround the courtyard. And get four of them to cover the entrance to the monastery itself, just in case there are some more reds inside. Right, Colonel. Ah, right. Eighteen men in the courtyard. A regular Red Army unit from the look of it. Their rifles are stacked. Anyone in the monastery? No, I can't be sure. I didn't see the commander. He may be inside. And my guess is that most of the men are in the courtyard. Then we ought to be able to pick them off like sitting ducks. Oh, we need to take care of those two guards first. Quietly, without alerting the others. Oh. But leave it to me. I'll try a little bluff. Just be ready when I call you. Oh, what the devil is... Shh, shh, shh. Hoyles, who goes there? No need for the rifles, brothers. I'm a friend. Where the devil did you spring from? I heard the singing, saw the fire, so I thought I'd pop in and say hello. What's your unit? The Ninth Partisans. Our main group is down by the crossroads. As a matter of fact, I was wondering if we could scrounge some provisions. We've had a hell of a day. I've got a couple of the men with me. Where? In the cops there. Follow them forward. Let's have a look. Oh, Zaka! Paul, come on out. It's all right. Good evening, brothers. Evening, Tavari. Yeah. Wait a minute. I know you from somewhere, don't I? Me? Devil, take it. Yes. You're a Samarian, young Paul Samarian. I used to work for you. But I heard you were with the others with the what? It's a trick. Quick, get the thing out. Uh, 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 leave him, uh, man. We'll leave him. Uh, He's unconscious. He can't do any harm. Leave him. The only good red is a... Dead red. Ah. Oh my God! Here, he won't wake up again. The men are taking up position around the wall. Right, we'll give them five minutes, then we'll charge the gates. You and Paul hide the bodies in the cops, Voitek. Yes, come. Yes. You are shocked, Tremaine. Why? The man was unconscious, and you cut his throat from ear to ear. And the look on your face, it was like a wolf. <laughs> I told you, I hate them, I hate them all. One day I will tell you what they did to my mother and my father and my sister. In Russia there is no such thing as moderation. We do everything by extremes. Yes, I would like to kill them all, one by one. Lenin, Trotsky, all of them. I would fill the rivers of Russia with their bodies. But it won't happen. Your American friend, Major Story, he was right. The old Russia. The old, sweet Russia. We shall never see her again. We, people like me, the old aristocracy, even our little father, the Tsar, we're finished. A dying species. But when Story said that, you threatened to kill him. He insulted the Tsar. But in other ways, Story was right. We clung to our old-fashioned, out-of-date world for too long. We built a high wall around our lives and did not choose to see or understand what was happening on the other side. A different sort of world is coming, and we are not equipped to live in it. As for myself, I have no desire to do so. You're a hard man to understand. Don't try. The greatest philosophers in the world have tried to penetrate the Russian soul and fail. We're ready, Colonel. One shot from you is to be the signal. What's the disposition, Paul? We have 20 men around the walls, 10 to each side. Uh, 10 men are covering the rear. Mm. I've put five men to cover the main building and five back in the copse there to take anyone who might try to make a run for it. Excellent. Did you tell the men there is to be no quarter? <laughs> there was no need, Colonel. They know. Right. I'll fire the first shot as a signal, then you and I and Tremaine will charge through the gate. Ready? Yes. Yes. Well, 
was easier than I thought. Did we get them all? Everyone, Colonel. Anyone in the buildings? Only those two. They seem to be the commander and his deputy. Right. Get the mess cleaned up, post guards, and then tell the men they can have the sheep meat. I shall be back in the morning. Where are you going? We have certain allies in the town. It is necessary to contact them urgently. Well, then let's go. Very well. Did you hear that? Train whistle? That's the royal flush. She's arrived in a Katerinburg. The line is blocked, Major. They can't cross the breach. I don't think we are welcome. There's only one way to find out, Klaus. Give me that field telephone. Sergeant Kelly, story here. When I shout, I want you to disembark your Marines and line them up on the track. I want the real McCoy, a guard of honor. I never mind who for. I want to show those guys what a real American Marine looks like. Right, Klaus. Take her up to the barricade. Real slow. Yes, Bez. It's like going into the mouth of a lion. They have troops with machine guns and rifles all the way along the embankment on both sides. Well, they would have, wouldn't they? There's a war. Now listen, don't fret yourself. Like I said, we're neutral. We're Americans. And I got a piece of paper right here in my pocket, signed and sealed by Admiral Knight to prove it. You are American. You are looking like an American. You are speaking like an American. It's not the same for me. You are an American sergeant. No argument about that. We enlisted you, Klaus, remember? Ah, I hope the Bolsheviks understand this. Listen, if you get yourself killed, I personally guarantee that the government of the U.S. of A. will put in an official protest. Oh, thank you. How do you say it? I am thanking you very much for nothing. Okay, stop here, Klaus. Right. Here comes your commander. Just take it nice and easy. Hi there, comrade. Who are you? What do you want? The name is Story. Major Story. I'm American, and uh, this here train is the property of the United States government. You want to go into town and rustle up some supplies? My name is Dukov. I'm the deputy commander here. I must warn you that if this is a trick, it will cost you dearly. Hell, this ain't no trick. Like I said, we want supplies. Where did you come from? A long ways. From the east. Arms, perhaps. Where the whites have their headquarters. Oh, hell, we met all sorts on this trip. Whites, reds, and all the colors in between. We're neutral. You know that Americans are neutral, don't you? I have heard so. Well, take a look. We got maybe 18 U.S. Marines aboard. One engineer, one fireman, and me. <laughs> we ain't up to start no war. I will look, I think. Yeah, well, you do that thing. Okay, Sergeant, get your men off their butts and down onto the track. Okay, you heard that. Now move it. Move it. Come on. Form up along the track. What is this? Come what on, are they doing? Up, Just want to show you an old American welcome, Commander. Would you care to inspect our detachment of Marines? Klaus, I'm sorting this out. Nip along to the bridge and see what you can see. Very well. Well, Commander, uh, everything okay? You satisfied? It seems to be in order. Welcome to Ekaterinburg, Major. I will give the order to remove the barricade. You will excuse me. It will not take long. Major! What you see, Klaus? They have wired the bridge. Under the center span. Enough dynamite to blow us to heaven. Well, they'd have a hard time doing that with me. I reckon I'm headed in the opposite direction. <sighs> it's all okay now, you think? Sure, we're in. Now the only problem will be how to get out. There's a land that bears a well-known name. Though it is but a little spot, I say it is first on the scroll of fame. And who shall say it is not? Tis the star of the earth, deny it who can. The island home... Of the Englishman. Are there any Bolsheviks in England, Miss Meg? Oh, of course not, Natasha. We should never tolerate such people over there. Then I think I would like to go to England. Perhaps you will one day. But we must go together. You and me and Misha mm -hmm. and Collier. We must take Collier. Would you like to come to England, Collier? Yes, little sir, if the good God would permit it. You shall come, Collier. Oh, see who that is, Collier. Mm. Be careful. Children, quietly now, off to bed. I'll come to say prayers with you in a moment. Yes, sir. Quickly, sir. off you go. Come on, Bishop. Who's that? Dukov. Nikolai Dukov. Oh. I wish to speak with the English woman. <clears throat> Let him in, Kolya. Yes, Missy. Good evening, Commander. 
Ah, you remember me from the woods when we were digging those new trenches. Naturally, I remember you. I like you with your hair down. It suits you. <laughs> yes, I like it much better. What do you want? It's getting late. Oh, is this how you welcome guests in England? I come as a friend. I'm sorry, I apologise. I have nothing to offer you except a little cabbage soup. Oh, no, I'm not hungry. Tell me, did you learn to fire the little pistol I gave you? I practised in the woods. I, I brought you some more ammunition for it. Here. Thank you. Uh, I'll be in the kitchen if you need me, Missy. Yes, thank you, Collier. Now, hold out your hand and close your eyes and see what else God has sent you. Really? You're always making jokes. Oh, it's no joke. Here. It smells like... <gasps> coffee! Real coffee! Oh, that's heaven. I haven't tasted real coffee for months. Oh, thank you, thank you. Where did you get it? Or shouldn't I ask? Oh, it's American. American? But how can... You'll never guess. There's an American train in the station. I'm a sort of friend of the commander. I don't understand. An American train here in Ekaterinburg? How did it get here? Why has it come? What sort oh, of train... Oh, wait, wait. You'll trip over your tongue if you ask so many questions. <laughs> First, it came from the east, so I presume it will go back there eventually. They came into town for supplies. Imagine that. Supplies in a Katerinburg. They'll be lucky to get a wagon load of coal. I can offer you a cup of coffee now. Real coffee. Oh, no. Keep it for yourself. In any case, I can't stay. I'm on duty again at five in the morning. I just... I, I just thought I'd share my good fortune with you. It really was very kind of you. I do appreciate it. I'll say good night then, Margaret. <laughs> you know you should wear your hair down to your shoulders all the time. It wouldn't be practical. <laughs> Perhaps not, but it would be better. You're a beautiful girl. You, you shouldn't try to disguise it. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank you again, Nikolai. Kolya! Kolya? Yes, Missy? Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear? Yes, Missy. But did you understand what he said? Did you understand? Oh, Kolya, Kolya, there's an American train at the station. It's the chance we've been waiting for. I'll go there in the morning. I'll talk to them. We'll go east. We'll all go. They can't refuse to take us. Oh, Kolya, it's like a dream come true. <laughs> we'll celebrate. We'll have a cup of real coffee. American coffee. It's getting dark, Colonel. There's a curfew. If we're caught on the streets without papers... Not much further now. Down this alley and we're there. Who are we going to see? You'll find out. Look for a house with green shutters. The shutter to the right will be half open and a scrap of rag hanging from the top as though it had been caught there. It's a signal. There. Look. That must be the one. Who is that? Mikhail Tambov. Who wants him? Zakhar Kazakov. Zakhar, it is you, Zakhar, my boy. Let me look at you. Yeah. Who is that you have with you? This is Captain Tremaine, a special envoy from the British government. Mm -hmm. Tremaine, allow me to present my friend, Mikhail Rombert. No, no, not Rombert. Here I am, Mikhail Tambov, at all times. I'm glad to meet you, Captain Tremaine. You have left it late, but not too late, I hope. You received our messages? Yes, yes, we still have our friends. Your messages come through. You have things prepared? Yes, as far as is possible. I have identity papers and passes for you inside. Mm. They'll get you through if you are challenged. Let us go in and talk. One more moment. I have a visitor inside, an important visitor. Who is it? Don't worry, my lad. He is one of ours, one of our best people. He worked for me when I ran the special division of the secret police in Moscow. He can be trusted absolutely. Come in. Oh, by the way, do not be surprised by the uniform he is wearing. Sergo, our friends have arrived at last. Captain Tremaine, Zaha, allow me to present special political commissar, Sergo Mogilov. He came from Moscow ten days ago. His assignment, which came direct from Lenin himself, is to guard the imperial family. A political commissar? Do not look so surprised, my friend. We have quite a few people working within the ranks of the Bolsheviks. But this is a stupendous piece of luck. 
I mean that they should have made you responsible for the Tsar. It will make our task that much more easy. I wish that were true, Zakhar. I don't understand. If, if he's in charge... Let me explain. It is a question of the local situation. The regional Soviet here is very militant, and Moscow is a long way away. My orders were to move the family north if the whites threatened Ekaterinburg, or if they are in any danger. Why should Lenin be concerned for their lives? He doesn't give a fig one way or the other. But for the moment, it is in his interest to keep the imperial family alive, as possible bargain encounters with the Germans and the British. But the local Soviet do not see it that way. They want to execute the Tsar, all the family. They have removed the guard I placed on the House of Special Purpose and replaced it with their own men. And they have immobilized my special train. I have protested, naturally, but they simply ignore me. So you see, my friends, the situation is as bad as it can be. The Tsar is threatened from two directions. If the white armies storm the town, the Reds will almost certainly shoot the Tsar and the others simply to stop them being rescued. On the other hand, the Reds may not even wait for that. They could kill them in the next day or so. Then we have to move quickly. Have you got everything organized according to the plan I sent you? It is all arranged. Well, how soon can you put your part of the operation into action? Oh, I should need at least 24 hours to warn our friends, mobilize the transport and so forth. Well, then we move the day after tomorrow. We may not have that much time. Why do you say that? There is a public meeting in the town tonight called by the regional Soviet. They may well decide the Tsar's fate there. Will you be present? Of course. Well, I think that Zakhar and I should attend also. Hmm? You said that you have papers to cover us, passes and so forth? Yes, they are here, but is it wise for you to go? If they take a decision about the Tsar tonight, I want to know what it is, how much time we have. Then we had better go. Wait, before we leave, tell me, how is his Imperial Majesty? All things considered, he is well, brave and dignified in face of every insult, as you would expect. Mm. But I am concerned for his son, the Tsarevich. He has always suffered from hemophilia, as you know, and recently he fell and cut himself badly. The doctor arrested the bleeding, but it has sapped the boy's strength. And the Tsarina and the four girls, the Grand Duchesses? The Tsarina behaves strangely. I fear that the strain has disturbed her spirit. She spends much time alone in prayer. When one speaks with her, she is not, not always coherent. The Grand Duchesses have been brave enough, but, how can I put it, they have little privacy. They are under constant strain. Sergo, the time, the time, the meeting of the Soviet. Yes, I must go. Captain Tremaine and Colonel Kazakov had better follow at a discreet distance. The meeting is in the Anton Chekhov Theatre. If I were you, I should mingle with the crowd and sit at the back. Uh, where will you be? Uh, later on, I mean. After the meeting, I shall go back to my train. I'm living aboard. Or then, if necessary, I will call on you there. Come. I will check that the coast is clear. That must be Victor Gromyko, the chairman. He is the one who wants to cut the Tsar's throat. Well, I'll cut his throat. Shh. Look at them. Look at the scum. The new rulers of Russia. They stink worse than the Pakora Marsh. Oh, will you shut up, you blasted fool? Control yourself or we'll all be done for. It's hard to keep one special. Just try, will you? Comrade Commander Sablin has the platform. Comrades, brothers, I have just come from the southern front. I will not disguise from you the fact that our position is serious. Ekaterinburg itself is in danger. I make no bones on that score. Our Red Guards and volunteers have been fighting for days without sleep. Comrades, we need more arms. We need supplies. Above all, we need volunteers to hold the front. I call upon you to give everything to the cause of the People's Revolution! Comrades, comrades, the workers of the Shimano factory pledge themselves to work even harder. The miners on the Borlin pit will help to beat back the White Army. to give up their lives for what they believe. Well, they're, they're good people. They're good, yeah. decent people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the tragedy is that it ever came to this. Better stop talking and act. Yeah. 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 All go into the town, into the countryside, and mobilize every able-bodied person for the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm sure the meeting is with you. But before we close, there is one 
other important matter to deal with. As you all know, the Romanovs are our prisoners. <laughs> Now, the regional Soviet sent a request to Comrade Lenin asking that the Romanovs should be put on trial uh, here in a What did you call them? Good, decent people? They're a mob, a rabble. But these things must be done in a proper, organized, revolutionary manner. Yes. I propose that we give Moscow until noon tomorrow to reply. If we have no answer to our request by then, I further propose that the Romanovs be brought immediately before the People's Tribunal for Revolutionary Justice for trial and sentence. Meeting close. Phew, it's a relief to get out in the street. It's like an oven in there. It's worse, far worse than we thought. I'm going to the monastery to get the men. Oh, now ease off. Take it easy. Take it easy. You heard what they said in there. We have until noon tomorrow, if that. I wouldn't trust them to wait that long. God in heaven, man, you heard them baying for blood like a pack of hounds. Uh, quiet. A patrol. Let it pass. Now, let's think this out quietly and carefully. We haven't time for that. I haven't come all this way to be thwarted at the last moment. There's only one way now. Tonight, before it gets light, we'll storm the House of Special Purpose and pluck them out. I'll get one squadron to create a diversion while the rest make the assault. The guards will be half asleep. They won't be expecting us. It's crazy. It's a recipe for disaster. Look, my friend, you don't have to play any part in it. I hereby absolve you. I'm grateful for your help so far, but if you want to step aside now, I'll understand. Now, listen, Zaka, listen to me. I've come a bloody long way, too, and I'm not going to stand back and let you mess everything up. Now, listen, do you want the Tsar and the others alive or dead? Because if you persist in this madness, they will surely die. The first thing the guards at the House of Special Purpose will do when your Circassians go charging in will be to shoot down the Imperial family. Will not work, Zaka. It just will not work. <laughs> Have you an alternative? Yes. We bring our plan forward. Instead of the day after tomorrow, we act in the morning. But Mikhail said he would need at least a day to arrange the transport, to warn people. Well, then he'll have to hurry things up, won't he? Listen, you go to see him now, tell him of the change, don't let him argue. Make certain that he has everything ready and in place by 8 a.m., not a second later. I'll go and see Mogilov on his train and warn him. We'll meet back at the monastery at 7 a.m., right? Can it be done? Can it be done in time? It will be done, Zakhar, because it must be done. Now, hurry, hurry! So, Lord Willis, there we were in the Kettering The last stage of a long journey. <laughs> As you say, my dear. And the hardest part was yet to come. You had to change the plan to rescue the Tsar, or rather bring it forward. Well, we had no choice. The local Soviet planned to execute them at noon the next day. We had to move before then. So, while Kosarkov was preparing his men for the assault on the House of Special Purpose, I went to talk with political commissar Sergo Mogilov a secret royalist agent working within the ranks of the Bolsheviks. So, we shall have to make our move in the morning. Of course, there's no other alternative. It is our only, our last chance, transport. The Kasakov is seeing about that now. Uh, tell me, how many guards will be on duty at the House of Special Purpose? Two at the entrance to the first stockade, yeah. four in the courtyard guarding the main entrance, six in the grounds at the back. Two will be manning the machine gun at the attic window. Is it uh, 14? There may be two more in the courtyard while the Imperial family are exercising. Does the Tsar know? I mean, does he know that you're a friend? No. He believes I am a Red. <sighs> it would have been too dangerous to reveal myself. We are watched by too many eyes. It is the story of my life. I've been in the secret police so long, I feel like a man with two souls in one body. <laughs> Do you know, even my wife thinks I'm a Bolshevik? But somehow the Tsar must be warned. He must be warned to be ready. It's essential that at ten o'clock tomorrow morning, the whole family should take their usual exercise in the yard. And they must all be ready to obey us without question. We shall have minutes, seconds only. I will get word to the Tsar somehow. Mm. But 
whether he will believe me, that is another matter. He may regard it as some sort of trap, and who shall blame him? Well, show him this. A ring with the insignia of the royal Romanov house. Why did you get it? And from King George V. It was given to him by the Tsar himself. It will prove my credentials. And what will you do afterwards? Will you come with us? No, my friend. I am too valuable to our cause where I am. I shall stay. Well, good luck, then. And to you, my friend. And to you. Major, hmm? look, we have a visitor. Tremaine, what are you doing here? I've been paying a few calls, Tom. I thought I'd drop in on you. <laughs> At this time of night? Hey, you okay? I'm fine. Well, you don't look it. Sit down, I'll fix you a drink. If I sit down, I shan't get up again. So, uh, when are you going to collect your uh, parcel? Tomorrow, in the morning. Tell me, Tom... What time were you planning to leave Ekaterinburg? You tell me. Well, could you make it, say, around 10.15 in the morning? Oh, you son of a bitch. You want to use the Royal Flush as a damn decoy. How did you guess? Hey, do you know what they got out there? They got dynamite under the bridge. They, they got field guns covering the tracks. They, they got... blow this train to Kingdom Come. All right, if you don't feel you can help. No, no, I, I didn't say that. Just what exactly do you want? Well, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, the balloon will go up. By 10.30, perhaps sooner, they'll start chasing somebody. And you wanted it should be the royal flush. Exactly. If you could pull out at about 10.15, my guess is that they'll think you've got the Tsar and his family aboard. And while they are chasing the royal flush, you'll be heading off in a different direction, perhaps. There's no risk to you. When they stop you, you play the innocent. Let them search the train from top to bottom. Naturally, they'll find nothing. Ah, real simple. Okay, okay. Now listen, uh, if we do make it out of here, we'll wait down the line that spot at the forest where you got off. Uh, we'll hang on for, say, uh, 24 hours. So if anything goes wrong with your transportation, you head for us, right? Right. I demand to see the train commander at once. Huh? I'm sorry, man. I can't allow you aboard. What? My orders uh, uh, What the hell is going on down there, Kelly? This lady is asking... Are you in charge of this train? I guess you could say that, yes. Then let me introduce myself. My name is Margaret Wellmeadow. Uh, Miss Wellmeadow. You know me, but... Uh, who... James Tremaine. Uh, we met in Petrograd last oh, year. Good heavens, I hardly recognized you, Mr. Tremaine. Uh, nor are you, Miss Wellmeadow. However, your being here is a piece of great good fortune. I'm sure you will be able to help me. Or if I can, although I must warn you that I'm Through not... Through circumstances which I will not go into now, I find myself responsible for the welfare of two young children. It is essential that I take them east, to safety. That is why I'm here. I wish to take passage on this train when it leaves. Uh, this is a military train, ma'am. Uh, the trip we're making could be dangerous. Oh, I am quite used to danger, sir. And I believe it will be infinitely more dangerous if we remain here. Now, if you will direct us to the appropriate wagon... Us? Oh, of course. I thought I'd made myself plain. I have the two children here with me, together with our friend and servant, Collier. Here? Here. We are packed and ready. Uh, look, ma'am, can't you understand... Uh, please. Tom, take them. Huh? Take me. Okay, okay. I guess there won't be any peace until I do. <sighs> Kelly? Sir? Take this lady and the others and put them in number three wagon. Oh, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Tremaine. <sighs> My pleasure. <laughs> Is she an old girlfriend of yours? As a matter of fact, no, although I wouldn't mind. She's a very good-looking girl, don't you think? Hell, Spence. It's been a crazy night. It could be a crazy day tomorrow, too. This will do. Stop here, Paul. Now, the two sisters from the convent should be here at any moment. They pass along this road into town. What are we to do? Kidnap them. Mother of God! Kidnap two holy sisters! It's in a good cause, Paul. God will approve. And of course we shan't hurt them. All the same, I Shh. think... Here they come. There we are, sisters. A nice, clean, comfortable room. We shall only keep you here for a couple of hours, no more. This is outrageous. An outrage. The food we were carrying, that was for the Tsar and his family. We were on our way to the house of special purpose to deliver it. Don't worry. We will see that it is delivered. Now, one other thing. I'd like you to take off your clothes. What? We shall do no such thing. No such thing. Your headdresses, veils, robes and shoes. That's all. You may keep the rest. Most certainly not. Never, never. I'll give you two minutes, sisters. If you're not out of those habits by then, I'll send in four men to strip. Are you ready, Zaka? Once I get this damned veil in place. I must say, you look every inch like a sister in those robes. Have you seen yourself? Pull your skirt down, man. Have you no modesty? Uh, Samarin. Here. 
Uh, check it through once more. You and the colonel will approach the guards at the front of the house of special purpose, disguised as Sisters of Mercy. You will take care of the outer guards. At this time, I will arrive with two detachments of Circassians in trucks carrying the Soviet emblem. At a signal from you, we will charge the palisades. Hmm. There are two sets of palisades. It is essential that we get through the second one before the guards have time to recover from the surprise. The Tsar and the others should be in the grounds, and they will be expecting us. Now have the second truck ready with the engine running. Shortly, our friends are going to begin creating various diversions in the town, explosions and so forth. Ignore them. Is that all clear? All clear, sir. That's it. Let's go. Let's go. It's another one. What do you make of it, comrade? Perhaps the whites have broken through. They wouldn't leave the Tsar and the others in this house if the whites were near. Uh, here come the two sisters from the convent of the Resurrection. They may know something. What would they know, you fool? Look, there are a couple of trucks, full of our troops. They're drawing up here. What the devil's going on? Oh, with this trouble in the town, they may have sent reinforcements to guard mm. the Tsar. Or they may even have come to take him away. Ah, sisters, good day to you. Have you heard anything about trouble in the town, all these explosions? Wait, hold it. There's something funny going on here. You're not the regular sister. Oh, Quiet, you red bastard. Move a muscle and I'll let you have this knife in the guts. Mm. No, stand naturally. Those machine gunners in the turret room. Call them down here. Nice and easy now. It's a trick! Fire, comrade! Fire! I warned you! Okay! Come on, someone in! Forward! Come on, forward! Palisades. We'll never make it across the yard to the house as long as that machine gun keeps going. We have to. We have to get through. Cover me. I'll try to get onto the roof and deal with the machine gun from there. You round up the Tsar and the others. I've cleared out the machine gun. Make a run for the trucks. The Tsar and the Tsarevich must be in the house. I can see the women sheltering under the lee of the wall, but I can't see the Tsar. But I'll find him. Now, cover me. He's made it to the wall of the house. He's started to climb. Hurry, man. Hurry. Damn machine gun. You try to get the sun out. He simply mows all down. He's on the roof. Good man. Now, a grenade. Do the trick. Hurry, man. Hurry. He's done it. Forward. Forward. Look. Off the guards. So what about your men? Our losses were heavy. And the imperial family? We're taking the Tsarina and the Grand Duchesses to the trucks. But where's the Tsar and the Tsarevich? Well, I've searched the upper rooms. There's no sign. And I've been through all the rooms here on the ground floor. What the devil could... It... Wait! Listen! Listen! It's coming from the cellar. The Tsarevich has a dog. Quick! Down these stairs! Here. It's coming from here. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, sucker. He is dead. Our little father is dead. And his son with him. Sir, the Tsarina and the daughters are aboard the truck. We must leave now. We cannot wait a moment longer. They have killed them, Paul. They have murdered our Tsar and our Tsarevich. We cannot leave them here. Burial, Christian burial. We must... Sir, we have no time. He's right, sir. I told you, Tremaine, a dying species. Our little Tsar, people like me. Zakhar, think of the others. You take the Tsarina, you know what to do. You go also, Paul, my friend, leave me here. But, sir... I... You must, I have things to do. My pack is on the truck. Leave it at the gate for me. Go, damn you, go, that's an order. Yes, sir. As for you, Englishman, don't blame yourself. You did well, and we almost made it. Almost is not enough. It will have to do. What is that saying of yours? Half a loaf. Keep them safe, my friend. Take them where they will be happy. Goodbye, Zaka. Goodbye, James Ivanovich. They may have got away with the women, Comrade Mogilov. But they won't get far. As for the Tsar and his 
bastard son. They're finished. All the same, Moscow will not be pleased. After all, Comrade Chairman, it was you who took away my picked guards and replaced them with untrained troops of your own. My men gave a good account of themselves. Fourteen of the counter-revolutionaries were found dead or wounded at the House of Special Purpose. They will not help if you get excited. In a sense, our necks are on the same block. Uh, let us leave the question of the dead Romanovs aside for the moment and concentrate on the ones who escaped. How, in your view, was that escape effected? That's obvious, surely. The whole business was engineered by the Americans. An imperialist plot? Exactly so. The explosions in the town were deliberately timed to divert us. And it was certainly no accident that the American train left Ekaterinburg only a few minutes after the assault. Uh, did it have permission to leave? Um, no, but that is academic. We shall stop the train, never fear. Oh, we are across the bridge. That's something. Well, we're not out of the woods yet. Hey, look, there's that young red commander, Dukov, standing in the middle of the track. Huh? He's waving us down. You want me to go through him? Hell no, pull her up. He's not such a bad guy. Besides, if he opens up with that big gun up on the embankment, we're dead ducks. Hi there, Dukov. What seems to be the trouble? I have orders. The train must be searched. Uh, we got nothing on board to interest you. Then you have nothing to fear. Okay, look all you want. How far are we from Krasno now, Paul? Uh, two miles at most. Go on until you find some cover, then stop. You won't take any chances. I want you to send a small patrol into Krasno to check. Perhaps you better go yourself. To check what? But go to the house of Andrei Putilov. It is a low white house on the river next to the boatyard. I'm told it's easy to find. And Putilov will be expecting you. He is arranging for a boat to take the Tsarina and the others up the river Ob to rendezvous with the British ship. Tell him we'll bring the women in right away. I want to get them moving up river by early afternoon. It will be done, James Ivanovich. Why are they taking so long searching the train, Klaus? They are searching everything. Mm. Commander! Commander, here! Ah, hell's bells. Look, she have found that English lady. Uh, I knew she'd be trouble. I better go see what's happening. But you cannot do this. I am simply taking the children to safety. You have no authority to travel. How oh, does that matter when children are involved? Well, what's wrong, Commander? <laughs> this woman, the man Collier, and the two children have no authority to travel, no permit. Well, I can explain that. I gave him permission. Uh, you see, this lady is kind of a friend of a friend. You understand? It is not permitted. She must come back with me and bring the children also. I can't. Oh, please. Nikolai, I thought you were a friend. It is not a matter of friendship. Look, could I speak with you for a minute alone? Ah, sure thing. I'll get back to the locomotive. Holler if you need me. Thank you. Margaret. Yes? Why do you wish to leave? Nikolai, you must know that. I want to get home to my own country. I want to settle the children with their uncle in America, or with someone who will see to their future. I want to get away from war and fight. It won't last forever. Peace will come. Then, then a new life. A free, wonderful life. Listen, please. Mm. It, it's terrible to have to speak like this here. But I really have no choice, you understand? No, I don't really understand, but I shall try to. In, in normal times, friendship, all that sort of thing, can develop naturally, grow at its own pace, so to speak. And then when the moment is ripe... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not speaking clearly. You see, I want you to stay, Margaret. Not, not as a prisoner... This is my friend. I want you to stay of your own free will. Oh, Nikolai. I know I have no right to ask you. But sometimes the heart runs away with the head. And in these times, decisions have to be made quickly. I ask you sincerely, please to stay. Comrade and... Commander! Comrade Commander! Yes, what is it? A dispatch from Commander Sablin. The Czechs have broken our lines along six miles of the southern front. We are ordered there at once. I'll give the order. 
I'll be with you in one moment. Yes, sir. Margaret. I'm sorry. It seems... Please forgive my foolishness just now. It was not foolish. I allowed my subjective feelings to... <laughs> well, they say all things are for the best. Make a good journey, Margaret. You mean... We can go. Yes. Yes. You can go. What will you do now, James Ivanovich? There was no sign of Putilov, you say? Hardly anyone around. But one old boatman said that Putilov and his family were taken by the Reds yesterday, and they sunk his entire fleet of boats. Ah, and that's that. So what will you do? Oh, we can't stay here. There's only one thing for it. We'll just have to take Her Imperial Majesty and the four Duchesses south to pick up Major Story and the Royal Flush. It'll be waiting at the point where we disembarked the other day. Can you lead us there? Of course. James Ivanovich. Yes, Paul? I think we ought to stop here and make camp for the night. Stop? It's getting dark. I know the route by daylight, but in the dark I might lead you wrong. In any case, the men are exhausted. How far away from the railway? I would say about six hours' drive. We'll be safe enough if we camp here on the edge of the forest. All right. Pull over and they'll follow us. Right. <laughs> Guards are posted. Get some rest, James Ivanovich. There's nothing more you can do until the morning. What's that noise? The Tsarina, the Empress. She, she is not herself. It's bad. It's a strange sickness there, a sort of mania. After what they've been through... That's well, not surprising. It's odd, but I find it hard to think of them as, well, royalty. They seem sort of reduced. Just five more poor, helpless women. Get some rest. I'll call you. James Ivanovich, wake up, wake up! Uh, what? What is it? The Tsarina. What, what about her? She's What's gone. Happened? And the four grand duchesses have gone with her. Have, have you searched? Of course. No sign. How could this happen? What were the bloody guards doing? What could they do? The Tsarina said they wished to go into the forest. The guard assumed that it was for a call of nature. He didn't dare to ask. What? Didn't he follow them? Follow the Empress. How is that possible? One must have a certain respect. Well, damn the respect! How long have they been gone? An hour. Oh, good God! Why didn't you wake me before? We've been searching. The men are still searching. <sighs> We've got eight hours. Give or take a few minutes before Major Story gives us up and moves off with the royal flush. They've been found. A single shot. That was the signal. It came from over there. Come on, come on. There. The small clearing. Oh, my God. Wojtek, what has happened here? We found them five minutes ago, sir. The Empress and two of the Grand Duchesses, Titania and Maria. The Empress is dead. Dead? Her Highness, the Grand Duchess Maria, said that the Tsarina suddenly collapsed as if her heart had given out. The other two Grand Duchesses, Anastasia and Olga. They are not here. They have gone. What a day. What an accursed day. His Imperial Majesty, the Tsarevich, and now Her Majesty. We must try and find the two missing girls, Paul. Look at her face. Look at the face of the Empress. She is at peace, at last. We shall bury her here, in the freedom of the forest. Jesu, most sweet, O oh, glory of the apostles, O oh, Jesu, mine, lauded by the martyrs, Jesu, save her. Jesu, our saviour, most beautiful, have mercy upon her, who dost come to thee and make her worthy of the joys of heaven. O oh, Jesu, lover of mankind. We search the forest for the other two girls, Grand Duchess Olga and Grand Duchess Anastasia, but we had no success. In the end, we had to give up and make for the train. Tom Story was waiting with the Royal Flush, and we headed east. The next day, we were in Omsk. What happened to Kosakov? Did you hear? Oh, yes. Zahar died as he'd lived. 
After we'd left, he went to a meeting of the regional Soviet. He put on the full uniform of an officer in the Imperial Chevalier Guards and covered this with an old overcoat. At an appropriate moment, went onto the platform, ripped off the overcoat and stood there in that fantastic uniform. Well, the crowd was so shocked, I'm told, that nobody moved. And then Zaha took out a grenade, pulled the pin and shouted, I brought you a present, you murderers, so that you will remember the Tsar. Blew himself up, and half the committee went with him. <laughs> Typical. What I don't understand is that when the Whites did eventually capture Ekaterinburg, they reported that all the Romanovs, the women included, had been murdered at the House of Special Purpose. They said no one escaped. Well, you can take your choice. You can believe that report, or you can believe the story I've told you. Oh, I, I prefer your version, I think. <laughs> Thank you. It is, it's interesting when you think of what happened to some of the people involved. D Dukov, for instance, Nikolai Dukov, the young Bolshevik officer. Is the name Dukov ring a bell with you? No, I don't think so. Well, he became a general in the Red Army. He was one of the heroes of the defense of Stalingrad in the Second World War. And Miss Meg, uh, Margaret Wellmeadow, I think I can guess what happened to her. Oh, you can, can you? Oh, yes, I've been putting two and two together. Michael, your old servant, the man who hit me on the head when I first came here to Trevelli. Oh, well, what about you? Would he be Collier by any chance? Well done, well done, yes, indeed. <laughs> we gave him a home here, changed his name to Michael. There's more English, you understand. Well, go on now. Don't stop there. What else have you worked out? Well, you have Collier here. So your wife? Yes. She is, uh, I mean, she was, Miss May? <laughs> well, you said you were attracted to Miss her. May. <laughs> oh, she'll enjoy that. She'll like that. <laughs> what are you two up to? Uh, What's the joke? <laughs> tell her. Tell her. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that I assumed that you were Miss Meg. Am I wrong? Oh, I'm afraid so. James, it's mm. cruel of you to tease our guest. <laughs> no. no, Miss Meg went to America with Major Story. They handed the children over to an uncle. And did they marry Story and Miss Meg? No, no, they were just um, good friends, as they say. The Story wasn't the marrying kind. Meg changed and developed an awful lot. Well, if you're not Miss Meg, then who? Can't you guess? Why do you think we moved here? Why do you think we guard our privacy so well? I fell in love with James on the train, on the long journey to Vladivostok, and he with me, I think. No, oh, there's no thinking about it. I've been in love with her since that day in the forest. My sister Tatania entered a religious order and went to West Africa as a nurse. She died there 20 years ago. Mm. Allow me to present the last of the Romanovs, the Grand Duchess Maria. Not any longer. No. I prefer to be known as your wife. Mm. Nothing more, my dear. And that, more or less, was the end of the story for me. Except that about six months after our talk, Viscount Tremaine of Trevelic died, leaving no heir. His wife, Maria, couldn't live without him, and she followed him two days later. Tremaine left me all his books and personal papers. He'd had many adventures apart from his exploits in Russia, adventures which one day will be worth the telling. Maria also left me a small but precious souvenir, a signet ring bearing the falcon, the personal crest of the Tsar. Strictly speaking, I suppose I should return it whence it came, to Buckingham Palace. But it was left to me after all, and I intend to keep it. The Secret of the Forest, Part 5 of the Buckingham Palace Connection, dramatised for radio by Ted Willis from his own novel, Ted Willis played himself. Morris Denham was Lord Tremaine, Jeremy Clyde, Captain Tremaine, Joyce Carey, Lady Tremaine, Elizabeth Proud, Meg, Bob Sherman, Major Story, Sean Barrett, Colonel Kasakov, and Hayden Wood, Nikolai Dukov. Mogilov was played by Nicholas Courtney, Gromyko by Cyril Shapps, Klaus by John Rye, Kelly by John Livesey, Sumarin by James Windsor, 
Sister Lyudmila by Pauline Letts, Sister Yelise Vieta by Jane Knowles, Wojtek by David McAllister, and The Corporal by John Webb. The serial was directed by Glyn Dimm.